Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the leadership session for the Security, Identity, and Compliance track. My name is Steve Schmidt, and I'm very pleased you could join us this morning for a topic that I hope is as near and dear to you as it is to me. That's AWS Security, Identity, and Compliance. We've got an awful lot to cover in the next hour, so let's jump right in. The first thing I want to get into today with you virtual folks is those highlights and announcements you may have missed. The AWS pace of innovation is really something to behold. Just in security, I think we're averaging nearly a new feature or service update every day, not to mention all the other services you'll interact with on a day-to-day -day basis. But all that augmentation and improvement also means you might miss something that's going to help you secure your environment. So we went out to our security experts and asked them for the new features they found to be the most impactful to their work. We've rounded all of those up and put them together in a title list for you today. For the second item, we'll get into the space I know many people will tune in to reInvent for overall. What are the net new things I can do in the cloud today? What are the new announcements, the fun new products and features? What are the new bells and whistles I can try out and experiment a little if I haven't seen them before? So I'll be breaking those down for you. Next up, I want to get into zero trust. That's a place we're seeing a lot of focus and questions from customers right now. So I thought it might be helpful to discuss how AWS thinks about the major themes of zero trust as well as how AWS can help you apply those concepts. Finally, I'll leave you with a mix of real-life tactical things that you can do today, and a few strategic places that I think may be worthy of your time. This 10 Places to Focus Today section drove significant positive behavior last year, so we wanted to bring it back and also update it with some new advice as well. Okay, so here we go. The 2020 Security Highlights. We've got a bunch of these to get through, so this will need to be a speedy update, but most of these should have some relevance to the security work you're handling out there. Before we start this section, though, a quote to set expectations. I'd say Mario Andretti had the right idea about speed here. And AWS innovates at a pace that can feel at times as if you're accelerating into a turn. But what's the alternative? If our philosophical choice is between innovating for customers and not innovating, I think you can guess what the decision's gonna have to be. After all, there's a reason Jeff Bezos wanted to name Amazon relentless back when he was starting out. Which brings us to Amazon Guard Duty. We announced a new capability this summer for Guard Duty. We now have S3 data events as a new log and event source that Guard Duty will continuously monitor. This gets you extremely helpful insights on data access behavior and threat intelligence. Specific things such as unusual geolocation activity, API calls from a known malicious IP address, or API calls consistent with data discovery attempts. Basically, you can now have Guard Duty monitoring both data access events and S3 configurations. You might know those as control plane APIs. Guard Duty is a security service I love. It's using anomaly detection and machine learning and continuously updated threat intelligence, both that we get from the outside and that we develop ourselves to accomplish all of this. And to get started, if you have Guard Duty enabled in a region, you go to the Guard Duty console, select S3 protection, and then click enable. That's it. That's the complete list of things you have to do. You repeat the same process for the other regions you've got in your account, but it's that simple. You'll start seeing new findings within a few minutes. Please consider doing this, folks. You might be surprised with what you find. Now, while we're on Guard Duty, let's throw AWS organizations into the mix as well. If you're already a customer of Guard Duty, you can delegate any account as your Guard Duty administrator, and then you can manage up to 5,000 accounts right from there. The delegated Guard Duty admin account is granted permission to enable and manage Guard Duty for all accounts in the organization within that region. The one thing to keep in mind here, though, is that Guard Duty remains a region by region service to enable. So you want a Guard Duty delegated admin account for each region that you want active. If you enable in US East, that's the only place it'll be turned on. However, this does allow you to better control granularity on cost and allows you to try out a region first and then roll out developments and deployments from there. And as always, you can enable your 30-day free trial of Amazon Guard Duty with a single click in the AWS Management Console. I've been in the UI meetings with Andy Jassy where he flat out told us one click and one click only. We've gotten there and we've worked hard to make it as easy as possible on your end. Okay, 
Let's move on now to Firewall Manager. What's happened here is there's now a new set of managed rules and a new version of AWS WAF available for users of Firewall Manager. Well, why does this matter? Well, you can now centrally enable AWS managed rules across accounts, and these rule sets are curated and maintained by our threat research team. There are also rule sets out there in Marketplace from customers and partners if you'd like to go that route. With Firewall Manager, you're already able to manage your DDoS protections with AWS Shield, as well as your VPC security groups, all in coordination with AWS organizations. We think that adding in this additional layer of support helps extend your protection even further. This is another AWS Firewall Manager and WAF collaboration. Your logging can now be centralized under a single account through Kinesis Data Firehose. Logging in this case refers to a list of timestamps, AWS resources, WAF actions, and of course, request details. We've already seen this feature is making it easier to enable logging across multiple accounts and web ACLs through a single firewall manager policy. We're happy with the early returns here and we think you will be too. Another service I love and I want you to love too is Amazon Detective. Detective now has the ability to analyze IAM role sessions to help you understand the actions of users and applications that they performed using assumed roles. So you can answer questions such as, what API activity did an EC2 instance perform? And which of my employees are using a cross-account role? By providing answers to these questions, Detective assists your security analysts in the diagnosis and understanding of root cause, which means that instead of building custom tools, exporting and storing and analyzing CloudTrail activity, your staff can start quickly solving investigative questions. This functionality, by the way, is included at no additional cost. Again, our focus is on your security for customers. We're always going to bias towards that. Now, you'll notice a theme developing, and it's AWS organizations. Hopefully, it's not going to come as a surprise that AWS organizations is going to be at the top of my top 10 list near the end of this presentation. Because with security, it's all about leaning into the power of scale. How can you implement security efficiently and with less lift for you and your teams. We think organizations is a major step towards both of those goals, which brings me to IAM Access Analyzer and AWS organizations. Yeah, it's a mouthful, sure. But Access Analyzer uses automated reasoning, a form of mathematical logic, to determine all of the possible access paths allowed by a resource policy. We call these results provable security, and they represent a high level of assurance for security in the cloud. Some ease of use here, you can enable IAM Access Analyzer with one click in the IAM console. And once enabled, Access Analyzer will generate a report that identifies access to your resources from outside of your organization. For example, S3 buckets to your organization that are accessible publicly. This is an extremely handy little trick. And as with guard duty, you're getting insights into your security posture at scale. This allows you to start and finish a project in the same afternoon around an ask such as, we don't want any resource X publicly accessible, make it so. Which brings me to single sign-on. Single sign-on is immensely important because it allows you to centrally manage access and user permissions to all of your accounts in AWS organizations. There have been a number of SSO upgrades this year from account assignment APIs and AWS cloud formation support to automation of multi-account access management. AWS Single Sign-On is now supporting zero downtime external IDP certificate rotation. And this should be a best practice for you to protect against certificate compromise. What? How so? Well, you generally want to enforce short-lived certificate expiration dates as a forcing function here. But within that enforcement, you don't want to be caught in the middle of a rotation without a cert. So the zero downtime portion of the wording here means that you can install a replacement cert while the existing certificate remains in use. And once again, this comes at zero additional cost within SSO regions. External providers who are also happy to help in this space include Okta, OneLogin, and Ping Identity. We'll round out the identity section with another certificate upgrade. Uh, this one means that you can share a private certificate authority with any AWS account or within your organization. Uh, some context here. This means that customers can manage a private CA in a central account 
and use AWS Resource Access Manager to share the certificate authority with other accounts or organizations where TLS certificates will be issued. Using Resource Access Manager, customers can share CAs to an account or an organization, and it works with Certificate Manager to allow the designated account owners to easily provision, manage, and deploy private certificates from the shared private CA. One outcome of this is that now AWS Certificate Manager can automate renewal and deployment of private certificates when used with integrated services like Elastic Load Balancing or API Gateway. This feature also provides APIs to automate the creation and renewal of private certificates for on-premises resources, EC2 instances, and IoT devices, so it is a really robust feature set. Uh, this also eliminates the need to provision duplicate resources to every account in a multi-account environment, thereby reducing the cost and complexity of managing resources in every other account. We found historically that driving down complexity generally leads to better security outcomes. If you can drive clarity, the vast, vast majority of people want to do the right thing. The next update is big for both IoT and audit reports. We've expanded the rate limit for cert requests from 5 per second to 25 per second, which maths out to around 2.1 million certificates per day. This provides better security options for those use cases that require a large number of certificates in a very short period of time, such as manufacturing IoT devices or securing service-to-service -service traffic in a service mesh. We've also added support for encryption of Amazon S3 buckets, which can be leveraged for certificate revocation lists and audit reports. Now then, we're going to talk a lot more about enclaves coming up. But just in case you don't have time to stick around, I wanted to bring this one up early as well. The reason we're so excited about AWS Nitro Enclaves being generally available is now customers can create isolated compute environments that are unavailable even to their own staff and use them to protect personally identifiable information within Amazon EC2 instances. We're talking about the kind of data here that involves healthcare, financial services, and intellectual property concerns the most important and critical things you can secure today to protect your customers. Again, a much deeper dive on this coming later on in the presentation. You've heard me tout our continued efforts to decrease any friction or pain points in your cloud security program. Uh, we don't want overly complex implementations slowing you down, nor do we want budgetary decisions playing a deciding factor in whether you secure yourself or not. That's why you'll see us regularly lower prices. And this was a pretty big one, even for us. What this means is Amazon Macy dashboard has been completely redesigned and features a price reduction of 80 to 90%, depending on the specific workload in question. We've enabled volume discounting tiers to get at any particular size workload. And many of our customers have told us this makes the biggest difference for them in applying Macy to their work. This price reduction was achieved by completely re-architecting Macy's data discovery engine to perform even faster and more scalable detections. Macy is another security service that features built-in native multi-account management through AWS organizations. So again, scale that assists with clarity, ease of use through single-click consoles, and inexpensive security choices. That's the place we want to be with our customers. Now we're coming down to the end of our security update but a few more critical ones that we've hoped you noticed, this one involving AWS Security Hub. Security Hub has now gone GA, and this is a service we think can give you a comprehensive view of your security posture across AWS accounts. If setting up CloudWatch events and creating the cross-account permissions is eating up too much of your time, or if your business has grown overly complex, Security Hub may be a simpler solution for you. The Security Hub automated response and remediation solutions offer predefined response and remediation actions to common security controls. There are 10 prepackaged playbooks in Security Hub, and they're based on the Center for Internet Security AWS Foundations Benchmark, a security standard for AWS resources. Some examples include applying recommendations that ensure you've got key rotation within 90 days, or establish strong password policies, or perhaps enforcing encryption of event logs that you've stored in AWS. We then iterated by adding in additional security standards such as PCI and AWS's own foundational security best practices. 
There's also a tabular view that makes it easier to understand your security posture relative to the security checks you have enabled in Security Hub. Within Security Hub, you'll see a visual summary of all of your security checks, as well as a count of how many checks have passed or failed. And because the controls are grouped by status, you can more easily focus on the failed or disabled controls. You can also filter and search the controls to pinpoint specific resource types and then sort by using any of the available table columns. Now, this is an example of a, a better UI that's meeting you halfway on your security progress. Uh, if we tell you that 12 things aren't best practices, but when then we bury those 12 things in a list of 100 that you've done well, we've done you a disservice. Uh, this is an example of how the Security Hub team is iterating fast based on customer feedback to meet you where you need to be. Our last real critical Security Hub update, you can now view all Amazon EC2 instances across all your accounts that are non-compliant with your configured patch rules in a single dashboard. AWS Systems Manager Patch Manager now enables you to automatically send patch compliance findings generated by your patch rules to AWS Security Hub. This gives you the ability to centrally monitor your patch compliance along with other security findings in a single view. Security Hub gives you a comprehensive view of your security posture across your AWS accounts and aggregates, organizes, and prioritizes your security alerts or findings for multiple AWS services. Patch Manager is a feature of AWS Systems Manager. AWS Systems Manager enables visibility and control of your cloud and on-premises infrastructure. Last one here. Amazon Detective now enables you to examine your Amazon Virtual Private Cloud Network flows. This new capability enables you to answer questions such as, what port or network service was in use at that time? Or, were any large data transfers involved? These details help security analysts investigate findings, examine unexpected network behavior, and identify other AWS resources that might be affected by a potential security issue. Once enabled, Amazon Detective automatically processes all VPC flow records from your enabled accounts, aggregates them by EC2 instance, and then presents visual summaries and analytics about your network traffic. You can now drill down into selected time periods to view the details of these flows, which I highly recommend. So, those were the security features I wanted to highlight this year. But I know everyone out there also wants the latest on the newer services, so let's get right into that. Here's a quote from FDR that I find instructive. To reach a port, we must set sail. Sail, not tie an anchor. Sail, not drift. This is really where AWS thrives, in my opinion. We don't drift. We always have a destination in mind, even if we know we'll need to iterate again and again to meet that goal. And our roadmap is highly influenced by customer requests. If you have an idea on something that we can do better on security, don't hesitate to reach out. That said, here are the newest security service releases. As promised, I wanted to get deeper into Nitro Enclaves. Enclaves are isolated compute environments for sensitive data, featuring cryptographic attestation to verify that only authorized code is running. I also want to note here that we now have a way to provide encryption for the various I.O. devices, storage, and networking, and the encryption keys can be managed off of the mainboard with hardware acceleration available to minimize performance impact. Other important properties of Nitro Enclaves, they work on standard Nitro instance types. You can choose the amount of CPU and memory that's carved from your virtual private machine. There's OS agnostic features here too, as both Linux and Windows support hot unplug of CPUs and memory. This can all be done via command line as well. Plus, you get all of the memory and side channel protections of a normal virtual machine. The dedicated pinned core that's used for Nitro Enclaves is not shared with the host. There's no shared L1 or L2 cache. There's no memory sharing. There's no page coalescing. Essentially, the Nitro hypervisor gets you towards that all-important goal of no human access. Continuing along this feature set, inside Enclaves are standard operating system boots. This could be a, a bring your own Windows license scenario, by the way. This gets into a very technical space very quickly, but going even deeper, Nitro Enclaves have a read-only boot file system. This is about reducing your attack surface area. We do also provide an open source 
a TLS implementation as well as a TCP proxy that runs inside of the host to allow for secure connections to KMS and other services. When we talk about the explicit security that Enclaves conveys, we start with the boot image signing and attestation process, with the KMS services providing a cryptographic pivot point for outside interaction. A typical workflow here might be for Enclave to use a data key to decrypt external data that can't be decrypted by the host itself and therefore is not available to your staff. The only way in or out of the Enclave is via a VSOC channel to the host. This also allows for some interesting public key encryption use cases, as we do offer a public key enclave via an API call. So now you've got access to massive amounts of processing power in an isolated compute instance that even your staff can't get access to. This is what's so exciting about Nitro Enclaves, and why I wanted to flag the general release again today. Next up, a product you'll be able to check out today, AWS Audit Manager. I know many of you out there are operating in highly regulated areas, so we hope this is a new service that offers you some easy wins. Okay, so what is AWS Audit Manager? Uh, this is a service that's going to help you access and assess your controls. In the old manner of auditing, you were often looking at snapshot audits, where you were asked to provide a report on a certain day. But that's no longer a constraint. Push-button audit reports are where we need to go with this. And you've seen this with AWS Artifact. That's the ability to get attestation of compliance about our controls, the things we operate. With AWS Audit Manager, you're now looking at your own environment and with the ability to prove compliance against regulations that you are subject to from your own systems. At AWS, in meetings for a project, we'll often ask, so what do we get for this? You know, what's the win for the customers here? So the key customer problems we're looking to solve here are manual and time-consuming audit evidence collection. You're gathering screenshots or logs across configurations, and then just for fun, you're also organizing it in a way that makes sense. Because you can't just hand off a thousand pages of logs to an auditor and say, good luck, have a nice day. You have to show how your business is enforcing controls around data retention or encryption or access control. Or maybe you need to prove that you're prohibiting direct access between credit cardholder data and the internet to align with PCI. Regardless of your individual compliance use cases, AWS Audit Manager continuously collects evidence, helping you ensure your controls work as intended so you can proactively manage and reduce risk. Under the hood, the service is gathering evidence based on pre-built or custom assessment frameworks that determine what evidence from which resources should be collected. You'll see we're launching with CIS, GDPR, and PCI here, with partners such as Allgress, CIS, Coalfire, Deloitte, Jacobian Engineering, Smartronics, and Teletech. So what are some use cases here? Well, you can move from manually managing evidence in spreadsheets to an automated evidence collection method. That's first off. You can now continuously collect evidence monitor your compliance posture against a desired state, and proactively reduce risk by introducing or fine-tuning controls. Lastly, if you need to perform risk assessments, we think it's a great place for the service to help you. In addition to the pre-built frameworks I just mentioned, you can also build your own assessments as well. To get started, go to the Management Console and activate Audit Manager. You can then choose one of the pre-built assessments that I just mentioned, or you can build your own. You'll then delegate evidence review to the appropriate stakeholders. Once you've done a sanity check on the inputs and the outputs, you're then ready to look at the reporting side of Audit Manager. We want this to be simple, so this is the runbook. Please give it a try. Let us know what's working for you, where we can go for future feature sets. We have Fiona Williams, Deloitte's AWS Alliance lead and former CISO, joining us on a call today. Fiona, welcome and thank you. I know you've been engaged with the AWS Audit Manager over our beta. What are your thoughts about the benefits of this service and what it brings to our customers? Thanks for having me, Steve. And I'm thrilled to discuss Audit Manager, which I believe should help technology professionals and auditors improve the efficiency of their audits. The cloud is the new normal, and many organizations want to move to the cloud at an even faster pace. Often, that speed is impacted by concerns about security and controls, which sometimes can be a blocker for companies to move workload to the cloud. And for organizations to test their controls and confirm that they're adequate, 
they need to rethink how they do that, as traditional audit practices don't scale to dynamic cloud environments. Audit Manager helps companies address this by proactively collecting relevant audit and control evidence from their cloud environment. And because it's a cloud native service, it allows customers to get started quickly and to scale as their business and cloud usage grows. Thank you, Fiona. Can you expand a bit on how AWS Audit Manager helps solve for the common challenges arising from traditional audit practices applied to cloud environments? There are three features that I really like and should help to make audits of the cloud more efficient and effective. The first is the predefined assessment templates. These templates are based on industry standards such as CIS, HIPAA, PCI, and High Trust, to name a few. And they should allow you to accelerate the development of your own testing templates. Now, these can be customized. You can add your own custom controls and add your own custom templates based on what your audit requirements are. The second feature, and probably the biggest time saver, is the automatic collection of audit data. So instead of manually reviewing and collecting audit data, the system automatically does that for you. It continuously gathers and tracks control data from sources such as CloudTrail, CloudWatch, Security Hub, and Config. So it's doing continuous monitoring and gathering of data rather than at a point in time. And finally, the built-in workflow. This allows auditors to add comments, to collaborate, to document their reviews, to delegate tasks during the audit. And all of these features, I think, will help you deliver a more efficient and effective audit. Thanks, Fiona. We really appreciate your time today. Okay, continuing along the audit front. I'm really excited to feature a new training program that we've launched, AWS Cloud Audit Academy. So what is Cloud Audit Academy? Well, basically this is a training curriculum for audit risk and compliance professionals that narrows in scope as you progress through the training, starting with cloud as a concept across the general industry, all the way down to the specifics on how to audit AWS and industry specific components about auditing the cloud. Here are some of the topics the Cloud Audit Academy gets into. None of these are gonna be shocking. These are the building blocks of any security program and both levels of training are aligned to the GDPR Privacy Directive, as well as global industry security and compliance domains, such as the Cloud Security Alliance Controls Matrix, ISO 27001, NIST 853, and SOC 1 and SOC 2. As you can see, there's a comprehensive list of topics within the security, compliance, and privacy domains here. And in the grand tradition of AWS training, there's something for everyone. It's meant to be a deep dive for your folks in compliance to understand how their work interacts with the cloud. Clearly, auditing is one of the last spaces out there where there are still people doing work that should have been optimized for them. The benefits of the cloud are massive for security, but we wanna see those wins conveyed here too. And both AWS Audit Manager and the AWS Cloud Audit Academy are steps in that direction. In terms of levels, you can choose both e-learning and instructor-led training formats. Attendees can receive continuing professional education units for these as well, and you can see on screen that we've got some levels within the levels. Within e-learning and in-person, there is also a breakout among general cloud auditing versus AWS specific. I should also mention that any in-person training would of course be incumbent on us being able to offer this in a manner that's safe for our customers. We've taken a lot of steps internal to AWS and Amazon at large in terms of safety. And so we've learned a lot. And clearly we won't be getting back to in-person instructor-led training until it works completely for our customers and our staff. To learn more, head to our compliance page and then to the auditor learning path. We look forward to working with you in this critical space. Okay, next on to the new services that we've got going on with AWS Network Firewall. First up, here's how it works within the context of your overall security services. This is a native firewall service that allows you to apply blanket protections for your entire VPC, regardless of the application type or protocol. This means AWS Network Firewall gives you control and visibility across both the network and application layer. Crucially, Network Firewall allows you to broadly inspect traffic flows to and from your VPC, and also over the internet and over Direct Connect and VPN. So we've got all the different network paths covered. From a technical perspective, AWS Network Firewall is a zonal service consisting of AZ isolated inspection points. The critical things here for customers is it's managed by AWS 
features load balancing, and has zonal symmetric flow forwarding. From a customer point of view, the main thing that you want to pay attention to is your endpoint policies. We're managing the fleet of EC2 hosts for you, including failover and auto scaling. We're maintaining OS updates and the other work that you would have to do if you are maintaining your own firewall. Going a bit deeper into those cloud native controls, IP, port, and protocol gives you baseline segmentation capabilities with the ability to allow or deny traffic based on the domain name of the destination instead of an IP address. Furthermore, the service has a stateful inspection engine that allows you to defend against common network threats such as malware intrusion and protocol abuse. You can also do things like identify if encrypted traffic is trying to leave through a port that's typically reserved for unencrypted traffic. Lastly, you can choose to allow flows through, drop unauthorized flows, or simply observe traffic patterns by using the alert action. So the tool set is very much aligned with the practical application of real security. This service is available now. We've got a few of the benefits listed here on the slide. Uh, in terms of network security, this makes it easy to deploy protection at scale across your Amazon virtual private clouds. Network Firewall is also a managed service that scales with network traffic and can support hundreds of thousands of connections at the same time. Finally, it comes with a highly flexible rules engine that supports thousands of customer rules for intrusion prevention, detection, and web filtering. And it's all native to your cloud environment. Once again, this is going to be an easy implementation if you'd like to try it out. You can find AWS Network Firewall in the Amazon VPC console. Uh, from there, you'll have a number of options around your policies, as well as the places that you want the service active. Okay, uh, so those are the big announcements that I've got for you today on the topic of security. But we've got a bit more time to get into the strategy of security before we end the session with some best practices we'd like you to consider. Zero trust is a term you hear often these days, and zero trust can mean different things in different contexts. One key reason there's so much ambiguity is the diversity of use cases to which it applies. Here's a quote from Alvin Toffler on the need to focus on the smaller things in order to do big things. Uh, Toffler, by the way, was the person who coined the term information overload, uh, so he clearly would want this section to be efficient and full of clarity. Just from a definition standpoint, Zero trust is, to me, a set of mechanisms that focus on providing security controls around digital access and assets while not solely depending on traditional network controls or network perimeters. In other words, we aren't going to trust a user based only on their location within a traditional network. Instead, we want to augment network-centric models with additional techniques, which we would describe as identity-centric controls. Now, keep in mind that another primary concept of zero trust is it should include attributes such as usability and flexibility. We all know that you can secure a safe at the bottom of the ocean if you put it in a block of concrete, but it's not a very usable tool at that point, is it? In terms of the keys to zero trust, let's look at two key dimensions. The first being the network itself. You're always going to have some notion of a perimeter in security the thing that surrounds the thing you're protecting, or the things, it may be more than one. For example, in many scenarios, a proxy is trusted in part based on its network properties. Most of the time, people are designing systems so that traffic from specific internal IPs is considered trusted. Or maybe you have a set of containers on the same host running as part of the same application deployed by a single DevOps team, and that's within a trusted perimeter. So the question becomes, where is my perimeter? How big or small is it? And you should make it as small as possible. And how easy is it to monitor and audit? And in terms of effectiveness and user interface, should we use a, a VPN for network isolation, but make it dynamic and hidden from the user experience so that users don't even notice that network boundaries are being created and torn down as needed? Or perhaps we break systems down into even smaller logical components and go with tighter network segments or even packet level controls around some applications what we consider micro-segments or micro-perimeters. Do we add in some kind of a gateway or proxy technology that enforces a newer kind of a trust boundary down the road? How about a combination of those techniques? And if those are the questions that come up when you're securing your network, a second consideration is always identity and access management. This again runs the, the gamut of use cases from humans with PCs or tablets or phones 
uh, to machine to machine or software to software communications. Across those types of use cases, we can see that identity, authentication, and authorization techniques can be much more different in practice, right? People don't talk to machines the same way that software talks to machines. And this leaves us with open questions around how to secure. Should we organize around security relevant properties of the end user profile, or maybe we want to alter access dynamically through some other factor, such as the strength of the authentication, the device type, the network location, the time of day, day of week, etc. Now then, identity-centric perimeters can be used to interact with AWS API endpoints, and they uniquely authenticate and authorize each API request. However, network-centric tools such as Amazon Virtual Private Cloud, security groups, private link, and VPC endpoints are also easy to implement to filter out unnecessary noise, which allows your security inspection services and your staff to focus on just the components that are important. But really what we want is for these two types of controls to not only coexist, but be aware of and augment one another. A real world example here is VPC endpoints provide the ability to attach a policy to enforce identity centric rules at a logical network boundary. So the two concepts, network and identity, share the same underlying principles, even if they differ in what they're trying to achieve for an organization. We want to focus on the problem we're trying to solve, because zero trust can mean different things in different contexts. One key reason there's so much ambiguity and confusion around the term might be the diversity of use cases to which it applies. But by focusing on the problem you're trying to solve, we'll spend our time improving security posture and outcomes, and avoid getting mired in low-value discussions. One of the discussions we have in Amazon quite frequently is around not trying to solve the entire entirety of the problem all at once. And I'll tell my teams, give me an 80% solution right now and let's iterate towards the final outcome. The same is true here. Constant steps of improvement. We believe it's best to think of zero trust concepts as additive to existing security controls and concepts really rather than replacements uh, because one size does not fit all. We want to focus on the value of the systems and the data that are being protected. Over time, the application of a zero trust conceptual model will continue to improve defense in depth and continue to make security controls we already have work better. Use zero trust concepts to raise your security bar, but don't issue blanket standards that lack flexibility. For many business systems, network controls and network perimeters will continue to be important and sometimes adequate controls. If we begin to look at the three use cases I just referenced, the first is to consider machine to machine communications. Uh, this is about authorizing specific flows between components to eliminate lateral network mobility risk. Basically, if two components don't need to talk to one another across the network, they shouldn't be able to talk, even if those systems happen to coexist within the same network or network segment. This greatly reduces the overall surface area of connected systems and eliminates unnecessary or unneeded pathways that an adversary might take advantage of, particularly those that lead to sensitive data. For this use case, our discussion should begin with security groups, which have been a part of Amazon EC2 since it launched. The point of security groups is to provide software-defined micro-perimeters. They also act as a kind of identity system, in which group membership becomes relevant for determining whether or not to permit a particular network flow, allowing for extremely granular rules without the burden of keeping them up to date as membership in the group ebbs and flows. Another way to get at this would be AWS Private Link. Using Private Link, a load balanced endpoint can be exposed as a narrow, one way gateway between two VPCs, with tight identity based controls on who can access the gateway, as well as where any incoming packets can land. VPCs don't even need to have routes between one another, so the outcome here is going to be robust machine-to-machine -machine network security. Our second zero trust use case, human to application, is about improving workforce mobility without compromising security. Right now, especially with higher levels of work from home, this is one that's clearly on everybody's mind. Now, traditionally, these applications existed behind a strong VPN front door. However, VPNs aren't always compatible with the full range of mobile devices that modern workforces leverage. So the objective here is to make the locks on applications effective 
enough that we can eliminate a VPN-based front door altogether. Depending on your risk tolerance and developer maturity, there are a lot of options out there. At one end of the spectrum, you may want a desktop as a service, which we offer as AWS Workspaces. Or you'd prefer an end user application as a service product, like AWS AppStream. Once you've got into that place, traditional security controls are then applied to the intermediary services. So a user with a PC, a PC or an HTML5 client can reach virtualized applications over the internet. Now you've got a desktop-like experience without having to worry about the security of the final device in the user's hands. The other end of the spectrum is connecting internal web applications directly to the internet. For this, we recommend a combination of AWS Shield, AWS WAF, and Application Load Balancer. Uh, going down the line, that would be leveraging AWS Shield for a managed DDoS protection service, AWS WAF as a web application firewall, and then authentication through the application load balancer in order to integrate with an identity provider to offload the work of authenticating your users. Using this combination, your internal custom applications quickly become just as flexible as software as a service applications, allowing your workforce to enjoy the same from a coffee shop flexibility while unifying your application portfolio under a common security model. And finally, our third zero trust use case, which is markedly different from the first two because it involves securing digital transformation projects such as IoT. This could be a connected vehicle use case where a car needs to relay a stream of instrumentation data over the internet to a cloud-based analytics environment. Historically, these types of workloads have always existed entirely outside the traditional enterprise network. So they require a security model that accounts for that particular situation. Here's where you want to use services that can issue unique device identities to every device in your fleet, and then use those identities and associated access policies to securely control how they communicate and interact with the cloud. And of course, I'm recommending services like that, but I'm also recommending you take a look at our IoT Device Defender service. But sales recommendations aside, we do think this use case will continue to expand as we see more workloads move closer to the edge to minimize latency and to improve user experiences. So to wrap this topic up, what I'd really like to see security practitioners focusing on are the principles of zero trust that increase your security posture. Don't segment out your identity and network security. Instead, make them complementary. Your controls should coexist and augment each other. And then it's about the use case itself. Is it machine to machine? Are humans involved? Is it IoT? This is gonna be where you're making security decisions that are appropriate for the things you are trying to protect against and to protect. And lastly, something we always advocate for at AWS, don't put inflexible mandates in place. Give yourself and your team room to grow with the technology that's out there. Okay, as we near the end here, we've had a lot of success last year with a list that we published around the top 10 places your security group should focus. So I wanna revisit that concept again today with a refresher. Excellence is to do a common thing in an uncommon way. For security, that means fighting for each inch or centimeter and really knowing your environment. So taking a list like I'm about to present you and doing a few of them gets you a few wins. But if there are a lot of themes and tactical things you can do to put yourself in an excellent position for 2021, that might be the uncommon action you should commit to today, really doubling down on your security mechanisms to make this guidance something that has actual tactical impact. Before we move on to this year's recommendations, I wanted to take you back to 2019's list because these are still relevant and they aren't items that you can now ignore. So if this is your first time seeing one of these security lists, you may now have 20 things to do. Hey, it's reInvent, this is awesome. You can expect the security advice to be prolific from a company that takes it as seriously as we do. Seriously, everyone, do take note of these if you haven't seen them before. And if you did take action on these items last year, maybe take some time and reconfirm you're still in a great place in these areas. And now on for our new top 10. Uh, we noted them this year as strategic versus tactical. Uh, clearly the strategic ones might require a bit more introspection, more planning, more time. And the tactical items feature things that you can begin implementing today. So let's take a look at each one of these right now. 
I've mentioned it a few times already. We think AWS Organizations is a place you can really pick up some security wins at scale because it's a place you can configure centrally. You're going to gain a lot more ability to rapidly up-level your environment. Organizations has a feature called Service Control Policies that will make your life better. For all of the accounts you have in organizations, you can use these policies to do great things like prevent deletion or modification of IAM rules, prevent tampering with CloudTrail, and prevent public S3 access. In this sense, you're replacing reactive controls with preventative and proactive ones, and that's a place we want your security posture to be. Next up, deeply understand your environment. This is very close to something I mentioned last year. Your monitoring shouldn't just be for when a bad thing happened. Instead, you can use tools like Security Hub, which is of course compatible with organizations, to implement a set of standards across like PCI or CIS. And it'll output a security score and identify the specific accounts and resources that require your attention. It is impossible to improve upon something without measuring it first. When you've got a security score, you can then, as a business, decide how to improve that score. Or if you're okay with any security trade-offs you might have made when building your systems and tools. Now, you've heard the, the buzzwordy phrasing around, just encrypt everything. Uh, and the reason you hear that is because oftentimes it is the last line of defense against an adversary. If all else fails, data that's improperly accessed can still be protected via encryption if done properly. We've got a few tools to help you that are listed on the screen here, and none of these should look entirely surprising to you. Our KMS service is now integrated with the vast majority of our services, including Guard Duty, Macy, and Certificate Manager. And of course, at the very minimum, you need to have a robust encryption plan for your sensitive storage. We offer a huge array of options on encryption for data at rest, in motion, where you're able to maintain the key and only allow access to the users you specifically choose and prove who has had access over time. Next up, federation. This can be handled through our AWS Security Token Service, or STS, where you're granting temporary limited privilege credentials with IAM for authentication. STS also has CloudTrail support, so you're then logging all of your calls for access as well. You're getting the time, the ID, and the access requested so that you've got a record of potentially abnormal access requests. I spoke about zero trust earlier, and this is a building block for zero trust because 100% knowledge of your environment, in other words, knowing what you're protecting, is the foundational basis to establishing a zero trust environment. Another quick win here is AWS single sign-on. From a single portal, you're centrally managing access across accounts and applications. Your users have access to the things they need access to, which they like but they don't have access to the part of the business they shouldn't have access to, which your security team will like. You can assign user permissions based on common job functions and customize these permissions to meet your specific security requirements. And this isn't even about AWS. Our SSO also includes built-in integrations to Salesforce, Box, and Office 365. Or, you can create and manage user identities in AWS SSO's identity store, or easily connect your existing identity source, including Microsoft Active Directory, Okta Universal Directory, and Azure Active Directory, or Azure AD. I mentioned exactly how to do this earlier through organizations, but you can also handle this through S3 itself with our block public access feature. So there's really not a good reason anymore to be caught unaware by public access. We've made it a space where we explicitly want you to choose that you want your storage buckets open to the world. We close them by default when you establish the bucket. You are secure by default. New buckets and access points don't allow public access. So this is about having yet another confirmation and another audit point in this area. If you do absolutely have to serve public content, do that from a small number of specifically chosen and exempted buckets. Do not make it a blanket thing. I cannot stress this one enough. You'll hear the term edge protection thrown around a lot, but this is just another term for those technologies and applications that are nearer to the internet in your architecture. That's why you often hear IoT and edge protection in the same sentence, because a single transmitter device 
is considered to be the edge of your protected network, which means the tools here are the ones on the front lines of security. And services such as Amazon CloudFront, WAF, and API Gateway are the easiest ways to get at this type of protection. CloudFront is a content delivery network that companies like Hulu or Slack, uh, Prime Video, and PBS all use to deliver content. So it's going to be a robust solution with considerable security baked in. I've listed the threat dashboard as a feature here because you no longer need Shield Advanced to access this. You can see a near real-time summary of the AWS threat landscape through the Shield console itself by going to Global Threat Dashboard. It's definitely worth a look. We've also published a threat landscape report with an all-up analysis by time period, size, type, and so on. Our seventh recommendation today, please, please, please consider automating your patching program. This can be accomplished via AWS Systems Manager, and we're building it in to AWS Code Build using a code pipeline. There are entire blogs, white papers, and videos dedicated to how to set this up in your environment, including one that's jazzily titled AWS Prescriptive Guidance, Automated Patching for Non-Immutable Instances Using AWS Systems Manager. Uh, so I won't belabor the point, but I will ask you to look into how you do this today because patching your systems are security vegetables. You may not like it, but you have to do it. Now this one, in contrast, is more philosophical and strategic. So it's a place you want to dedicate some resources to long term, as opposed to a set it and forget it kind of security control. What we're getting at here is multi-layered defense. And there are zero trust concepts in this one as well, but essentially it does you no good to have a robust firewall system without encryption. It's not effective to require a VPN, but then allow your user base to access PII no matter what the role, and so on. What you don't want is the idea of a coconut with a hard shell, but a soft and tasty inside. Make things difficult on potential adversaries. Don't rely on just one or two controls. This one's a lot for one little slide. But again, it's more about a way of operating in security as opposed to something tactical right this minute. Uh, this guidance comes about because we often have conversations with customers on how we do security at AWS. Well, these are some of our key concepts. We're making sure leadership is aware of security projects and opportunities every single week. Everyone from our CEO down is deeply aware of the places we want to improve, as well as why we feel that way. We're never a blocker in the security team for speed. Instead, we want to be the group that works with teams to make security easier and more efficient for them. And I think the first one here is critically important. Be optimistic and accountable. Uh, it's really easy to get caught up in a headline about security where something went wrong, uh, or when a number of things went wrong to create one big mess. But what you don't see are the trillions of distinct activities and decisions that are going right each and every day. There is simply no way to measure just how much positive goodness is happening around us all the time. You're watching Netflix while you're on your phone and you get a Slack notification. So many untold hours of work have gone into that one quick scenario to make all of our lives better. And as you're doing all that, it's almost always gonna be 100% right and in a secure manner. The bad days are outliers, they're not the norm. But with that comes accountability. When things do go wrong, own them and make the decision to do better. That's really our daily task in security, get a little bit better at our jobs about protecting our customers every single day. Get a little smarter. And that's where root cause comes in. Whenever you see something is not quite right, the solution isn't just to fix it. Fixing it makes it go away, but it may not leave to the eventual outcome that you want. Instead, figure out why things are happening in your environment, that's the sort of activity that can pay huge dividends when you solve the true root problem. The last thing I want to highlight today is diversity and hiring and training. This is a space that I'm passionate about. I fundamentally believe that a broad range of perspectives makes us far better as an industry. We must reflect the communities that we serve. We often see the new and creative thought comes from places that aren't thinking alike, where groupthink hasn't set in. The other part of this is about having a training program that allows for security engineers to be created internally. 
The shortage for security personnel is projected to hit over 3 million people in the next decade. There aren't going to be enough people studying this discipline for us to make up that gap with college graduates alone. So we need to do it with the talent that we have. If you have customer service people or physical security personnel or really any other operational domain where your people are showing drive and aptitude, have a pathway to security engineer for them. Invest in robust training for the employees who already embody your culture. External hires in this area are competitive and time consuming. So we're in the process of implementing multiple pathways to security engineering for our people internally. These are great jobs with a lot of autonomy and creativity. We've got to show people the way to get there first. People want to do the right thing and they want to be helpful in the realm of security. It's up to us to support their transition. So that's our session for today. I want to thank everyone for listening, and I hope I've given you a few items you can take back to your work and implement. You can follow me on Twitter at, at Stephen Schmidt. I post there every so often with uh, my take on security. That said, I hope you have a safe and secure day. You enjoy the rest of reInvent. The Security Track has a bunch of great offerings this year, so please do check out a few more security sessions if you've got the time. Thank you, everyone. Please make sure you complete the session survey.